it's go time and that means it's countdown time here we go mace yeah guess what we're in the same spot reunited and it feels so good are That's we right. actually are we actually quoting peaches and herb are you peaches or am i peaches or are you herb i don't know <laughs> i get them all mixed up from that era Peaches and Herb, the Captain and Tennille, mm-hmm. you know. Donnie what, and Marie. What do you call that? Crap Rock? Uh, <laughs> not sure. Uh, easy listening? Easy almost that's not, disco? I, that, I don't think that's really Yacht Rock. Like, even no, though, no. Yacht, uh, yacht Rock wasn't a thing yet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's right. And I think Yacht Rock has a little bit more elevation to it. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Anyway. Speaking of connections, Hi. how are you? I'm fine. You're fine. With, with you, as always, is Mace. <laughs> with him, as always, is Garth. Uh, with the Broncos, always, is Bo Nix. Seems like, that way. We've spent a lot of time talking about Bo Nix just this week, Mace. We've got more as more people continue to talk about what the Broncos can do at quarterback. Some are saying move up. Watch OBT2 tonight. Chad Ryder previewing his five-round mock draft. That's coming up YouTube exclusive, 7 p.m. But, Mace, why is it that Knicks and the Broncos is everywhere. Everywhere because there are a lot of people saying that Bo Nix is a stylistic fit for Sean Payton. Everywhere because the Drew Brees comparison doesn't seem to be going away, even though it's probably unfair to Bo Nix to compare him to a future Hall of Famer. I think it's talking about attributes and style. And everywhere because the cost of moving up into that top four is probably prohibitive. Sean Payton did say at the league meeting it was realistic, but is that something you really want to do if you're the Denver Broncos? Yeah, I think it just depends on where you have them ranked and how much difference there is because you can stay put at 12 and you can get Knicks, But if McCarthy is that much further ahead in your evaluation, then you have to move up for McCarthy. It's a matter of looking at what is going to lead to the better team. Are you a better team with Bo Nix at 12 or maybe even moving down a little bit, maintaining your draft capital, keeping Pat Sertan? Or do you think J.J. McCarthy is that much better to where you're willing to have a team that lacks its first round pick next year. Maybe it's first round pick the year after. Probably you're lacking either the first round pick in 2026 or Pat Sertan plus being without the 2025 first rounder and maybe even missing some day two draft capital, which you would use to build up the team around him. Is JJ McCarthy that much better than Bo Nix plus your next two first rounders, plus having Pat Sertan a long term contract. Well, and Bo Nix, the guy that you can start right away. JJ McCarthy, I feel, is the type of player that you need a little bit of time, a little bit of an on ramp, if you will, to his pro career. So the answer for me, Mace, is Nix. What's your answer? If we're saying, you know, keeping everything, not giving up Sertan, staying put at 12, the answer is Nix. And not only because I have Nix ahead of McCarthy in my rankings but because you're keeping all your picks to stay put and get a guy that everyone knows is a clear fit for Sean Payton. Yeah, that's the thing there. Now, the question is, do you love Bo Nix? Because even if you are trading down a little bit or standing pat at 12, if you're going to be Sean Payton tying your success or failure in Denver to a quarterback, if you draft that guy, that's a big question. Does Sean Payton want to tie his fortunes to Bo Nix? If he does, great. Then I think everyone will get on board. If not, you don't make this type of deal for a like. It's got to be love. Right. It's got to be love. You got to be love. If you're going to move up like that and stay and put at 12, here's the risk that you have. If Penix somehow goes off the board before you, I don't think he does. But if you do not move up to four because you've deemed that Nick's at 12 makes more sense, that's fine. If he's there at 12, again, Mace, I'm about being bold 
and then getting who you want to get. Maybe not moving up much for Knicks, but you have to be careful, especially with a team like the Vegas Raiders sitting right behind you, and they clearly want a quarterback as well. Yes, they and they may be willing to move up and, and jump you. Just They may be a little bit bolder in what they're trying to do than the Broncos might be. Right. A little bit, little more robust draft capital once you get beyond the first round. Remember the, remember, the Broncos don't have a second round pick. And actually, it's been very interesting to see some of these mock drafts taking the exercise of saying, well, the Broncos don't have a second rounder, so we're going to have them take Bo Nix here. When the right spot value wise might be 20 to 25. Mm-hmm. Or maybe even a bit lower than that. Right. Uh, I know that uh, a lot of people in the fan base are not real excited about Bo Nix, but maybe they should be. By the way, Keith, he says he wants Joe Milton. Friday's episode. You'll like our show on Friday. Yes. It's all about Joe Milton and Mace's crazy mock drafts. Anyway, the Bo Nix thing, I think, um, should we play the Kurt Warner clip? Like maybe if you and I can't convince people like, hey, you know, Bo Nix with Sean Payton, it could work. It look, it could look good. We want you to see this clip from Kurt Warner, who did a full breakdown. Check out his YouTube channel. He did a full breakdown on Bo Nix. Lots of great things to say there. But this final 56 seconds of Kurt Warner summing up what he thinks of Bo Nix, maybe this will change your mind. All right, so pretty good tape right there in terms of decision making, right? Seeing things, recognizing things, seeing through to the different coverages. You see a bunch of different concepts that they're running, a lot of underneath kind of choice stuff, but being able to see what's going on around it. So I really like that about Bo Nix is I feel like, again, more of an offensive, kind of an NFL pro style offense uh, in terms of how they're picking apart different concepts that they have, different things they're asking the quarterback to see. And he sees things really, really well. Has a good feel for when the defense voids areas and gets the ball out. Some of the technique things that we saw uh, moving fast inside the pocket, I would like to see that stuff slow down a little bit, engage his body a little bit better, uh, be more settled inside the pocket, the depth, the drops, so we're not looking to always take off and make a play on the run, but have the ability to set back, hold in the pocket, and drive some of those throws down the field. Yeah, and a lot of stuff said there from Warner that we need to pick apart, Mace, because yesterday when we played Nix's response to your question at the Senior Bowl, Mm -hmm. and he talked about freedom. Kurt Warner is there talking about, you know, lots of pro concepts in the way that you dice things up. Yes, were there a bunch of micro passes, 150 passes at or behind the line of scrimmage? That is correct. But when he was making decisions, it wasn't as simple as, you know, the, the play is screwball on three, ready, break, and he throws to one spot. He had the freedom, as Kurt Warner points out, to pick and choose. Yes, that's putting a lot on him pre-snap. And so you are evaluating the processor and you're evaluating how he can read a defense prior to the snap. These are areas where Bo Nix does appear to have some attributes that should translate. On top of that, There's the data that we were citing last week regarding his numbers under pressure, his yards per attempt under pressure. Excellent. Almost nine yards. It was Mm -hmm. 8.9 yards per attempt under pressure compared to 3.9 yards per attempt under pressure for Caleb Williams, 3.6 yards per attempt for Spencer Rattler, who was the lowest. Nix was the highest by a long shot. You're talking almost a first down every time you pressure that guy. This is, oh, they just dink and dunk. It's a bunch of screens. Okay, yeah, that's the offense, but when they pressure him, he'll attack you. And when they pressure you, especially if there's a blitz involved with it, you're creating open space. He's finding the open space. He's yes. finding the open man. And more often than not, he's leading the open man. That That's the thing that when you watch Bo Nix, it does excite you is the way he can lead his pass catching targets. He's setting up yardage after a catch. Does he have the deep ball club in his bag? No. Does he have a lot of things that are going to keep this offense on schedule? Yes. I mean, if there's one thing that I do concern myself with, it is that the lack of overall strong arm talent. I think he's got accuracy arm talent, but not Howard's arm talent. Does that limit what you can do in the red zone, perhaps, because we've seen, for example, Teddy Bridgewater back 
in 2021, rhythm and timing passer, could lead his receivers, uh, could drop a ball in the bread basket, but struggled in the red zone because he didn't have the velocity that, for example, Drew Locke had. Tight window throws. Yes. Or more difficult. He didn't have that, and it was one reason why the offense wasn't efficient in the red zone. Well, when we talk about the arm strength, then he has enough to get it there, okay? Let's let's not... Uh, it's not like he has a weak arm. Neither did Drew Brees. Brees had enough to get it there, and you've got a clip. Let's set up this clip, because you, you grabbed this one for us about Nick's uh, talking about his comparisons to Drew Brees. Where is this? Uh, RG3 He's on show? a podcast, YouTube show, with Robert Griffin III, RG3 of ESPN, and... RG3 likes the fit of Bo Nix with Sean Payton. Okay. So let's check that out. Okay. You want the Nix on the Broncos or Nix on being compared to Drew Brees? Let's talk about the Drew Brees comparison. First. Okay. Here's that beautiful bean footage. A, a lot of teams are looking for QBs, but there's one that like, I just can't shake. That seems like a really great fit for you. That's the Denver Broncos with Sean Payton. Of course, I know you've met him. You've probably talked to them. Uh, a couple times, baby, probably. You've been compared to Drew Brees in your decision-making process and how you play the game. How cool would it be for you to play for the Denver Broncos and Sean Payton? Oh, I think that'd be uh, a blast, you know, playing for a coach <laughs> like that who's been um, so important for the game, so important for the offensive game, um, and, you know, has made such an impact on, uh, you know, the game in general and with the quarterbacks he's coached. Uh, he's known, you know, a lot for, you know, what he and Drew Brees did together. But um, yep. when you're, when, when someone compares me to Drew Brees, it's like, I mean, come on, what are we doing? Like, that's the <laughs> ultimate, you know, one of the, the greats out there. And yes. he, I, I'll take it. Yeah. If you want to yeah. compare me to Drew Brees. Now I got a lot to, to do and a lot to learn, a lot to play for, but um, that comparison, um, you know, is very, um, you know, respectful, but I think, um, you know, in saying that there's a lot, um, you know, that would go into playing for a coach like that. It would mean a lot. Um, and I know that I'd learn a lot and grow a lot and, um, ultimately, you know, just compete and just be the best version of myself I can be so that, you know, maybe at the end of the day you work hard enough and, and maybe those comparisons start to see some parallels truly in the league. So there you go. You got a kid who, you know, understands people are comparing him to Drew Brees, but knows that he's not there and he's got a long ways to go in order to get there. Mace, I like that answer. I like that answer as well. Um, and also, he's saying this about wanting to play for Sean Payton, having already had some of the Sean Payton experience, having met with him yes. at the Combine. Yes. At least at the Combine. Um it's funny, we have not gotten word of a Bo Nix meeting with the Broncos since the Combine. Why is that? It's a good question. Mm -hmm. Well, we know how we found out about J.J. McCarthy because Sean Payton was riffing, <laughs> answering your question. He was vibing, man. Yeah, and you know, maybe he had a couple lattes. Lattes, it was the morning, yeah, right? Yeah, and he... 645. Actually, yeah, that would have been about um, uh, seven. That was about seven. Yeah, yeah no, it, it started at seven forty-five Eastern. Oh, okay. But if he's on Denver time, it's starting at five forty-five. Oh, yeah, it was early. <laughs> yeah, lattes were flowing. <laughs> we had to have lattes. We were there an hour and fifteen before it started. <laughs> yeah, think about yeah the, when that when that alarm went off. When that alarm go off, like at five fifty-five or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that was Eastern time. Eastern so, time. Mm -hmm. Yikes! But anyway. So he's answering your question about what you get out of a pro day, and he goes and he's J.J. McCarthy. That's how we learn about that. We learn about Michael Penix Jr. coming out of his pro day when, mm -hmm. it's, okay, he's going to talk to all these, he's going to meet with these teams next week, and he, he mentioned the Broncos. I think it was actually Penix that mentioned yes. the Broncos. Yes. So basically, we have found out, not through agents or anything like that, but from the team the, from the teams themselves i'll tell you what was interesting um we didn't get the answer on whether it was a longer form chat but spencer rattler was talking today with Kay adams about how the broncos made it tough on him in their meeting and we know that they met with him at the combine right and how 
Penix was the toughest, or, or pardon me, Rattler found the Broncos to be the toughest team, the one that really kind of dug deep, that uh, you know wanted to kind of test his brain. So, breaking point. Yes, the breaking. That's point. what Sean. Payton That's what said. Sean Payne said. The breaking. Where's your breaking point? point yes, at? we're going to throw more at you than you can handle. What's the breaking point? And is it that breaking point that makes the decision for Sean Payton? Let's say, for example, J.J. McCarthy didn't break. And let's say, for example, Bo Nix did break. It was a little bit later. Is that the lone decision that says, this is our guy? Perhaps, but also, where was the breaking point? Like, I don't know if it's simply like, okay, that there's, there's this demarcation point. It is, what if the, you know, what if... J.J. McCarthy had no breaking point, or they all have a breaking point. What if, like, if we're going on a scale like this, right? J.J. McCarthy's breaking point was here, but Bo Nix's was here. And that's where you say, okay, is it is it worth giving up all that draft capital that we could use to build the rest of the team? Is J.J. McCarthy, is that difference enough to give up all this to give up maybe two years of first round picks beyond this one. Right. That's the question that the Broncos and Sean Payton, and it's Sean Payton. It's, it's going to be Sean Payton asking that question. Yes. That's what it's all about. Respectfully to everybody else. This is ultimately a Sean Payton call. Well, there's someone else in that room. That's part of it. His name's Sean Payton's ego because Sean Payton's ego knows that he can take a quarterback. Again, if we're ranking scales, right? <laughs> Caleb Williams is a 10 out of 10, but Matt Eberflus is a one. <laughs> Sean Payton is damn near a 10. In my opinion, maybe it's a little lower, Mace. Bo Nix is a five. JJ McCarthy's a six. Well, Sean Payton's good enough to get plenty of good football out of a five. If, in fact, McCarthy is a six. If we're going off my rankings, I have Nix ahead of McCarthy. So is it Sean mm -hmm. Payton's ego that says, you know what? I could get that guy that looks like a superstar, but I can take that guy that's almost a superstar and make him one. Yeah. The ego. Of course, does that mean you're talking about Spencer Rattler maybe in round two and trading back? That's way too high for Spencer Rattler. Round three. That's still way too high for Spencer Rattler. Michael Pratt. Michael Pratt, yes. <laughs> yes. So you have, you have Pratt above Rattler. Yeah, yeah. Rattler to me is like a fifth or sixth rounder. Okay. I would rather have Joe Milton watch Friday's show. Um, You're not a Rattler guy at all. No, not at all. Not yeah. not at all. I think he kind of is what he is right now, mm -hmm. you know. And he turned his turned it around. He played better football, but he was the most improved quarterback over the Senior Bowl week. I thought there was a time, and I don't share this story often because it's not a great story. Okay, there was a time when there was an NFL team that asked me casually. Who's the best quarterback at the Senior Bowl on a daily basis? So I wrote him up. Uh, this team judged that that was Nathan Peterman. So, okay, yes, yeah. Spencer Rattler was the steadiest at the Senior I Bowl. I don't think that Nathan Peterman was the best quarterback the year he was at the Senior Bowl, though. We could discuss that. And besides, it wasn't my decision. I just wrote up the daily practices. And you said Nathan Peterman was the best? No, they said that. And what did you say? Like, what was your response to Tell that? me who else was in that class, because I can't remember off the top of my head. I know it wasn't <laughs> great, but I also know this. While I love the Senior Bowl, it's I, not everything. It's like 5% of a guy's grade. It's a, sm it's a small window. 5% of a guy's grade. Yeah. So there you have it. And that year at the Senior Bowl with Nathan Peterman, there, if memory serves, it wasn't a great crop of quarterbacks. Also, sometimes quarterbacks don't look that good. You know, Pat White was the MVP of the Senior Bowl game, and Pat White couldn't right. play quarterback. Oh, I don't care about the, the MVP, even though Rattler won the MVP. Right. I don't care about Practice is more important than the game, for sure. But I've seen some bad... Russell Wilson had a bad week of practice. Turned into a pretty good quarterback, you know? Um, Nathan Peterman was 2017. Okay, who else was there in 2017? Uh... C.J. Beathard, Sefa Lufau from CU. Okay. That was on the North team. And you're telling me Nathan the, Peterman wasn't the better one? Antonio Pipkin, Davis Webb, Josh Dobbs. I thought, Davis Webb was there. I thought Josh Dobbs was the best quarterback there. Okay. And I thought that C.J. Beathard was not good, but I thought he was better than Nathan Peterman. Okay. C.J. Beathard, man, had one of the worst throws I've ever seen <laughs> in a seven-on-seven -seven red zone period down yep. there. And I'm like... Oh my God. And Beathard's still kicking around, man. He is. He is. Although he's probably down to third team quarterback. 
because the Jaguars did trade for Mac Jones. Right. Yeah. He's still around. Nathan Peterman. Mm -hmm. Okay. First game, five picks. First he, game of his career. He got the five picks. He got the infamous uh, Blue Tarski in his first game. Mm -hmm. uh, 0, 0. Right. That was uh, it was a game against the Chargers, if I recall correctly. Right. I believe so. Yes. Came in and started and was terrible. Nathan Peterman is still in the NFL. He's with the Saints. OK. I just thought of something. That, OK. Uh, I mean, I think we're. I think at one point we were a bit nonplussed by what the Broncos were. I'm so, yeah, see, I'm nonplussed there. I rip off my glasses. <laughs> I think we were a bit nonplussed by what the Broncos were doing at quarterback the first week of free agency. Very much so, I think yes. now we understand, looking back on it. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you something. The thing that would have made my head explode or made <laughs> me spontaneously combust, <laughs> perhaps on this show, okay. is if we'd gotten word that the Broncos were signing Nathan Peterman. I cannot understand how Nathan Peterman is still quarterback in the NFL. Gruden loved him. Gruden absolutely loved him. And he uh, keeps getting work. And by the way, he was with Gruden for four seasons. Yes. And I, I will say this. I won't go into too much detail. John Gruden still has an influence in this league. Uh, people won't talk about it because he's the guy you don't talk about. But there's plenty of coaches that still use him as a resource. So, you know, maybe that's Dennis Allen. I'm just guessing, Mace. Nathan P and maybe Nathan Peterman, by the way, his career touchdown interception ratio is four to thirteen. That's bad, right? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we I, got like it's just like I don't get it, man. Right. I, I I do not get how he keeps getting gigs that kid is back on the escalator like what is up who does i mean you mentioned john gruden that may have something to do with it as well i mean who does he have pictures of i mean there it's or emails this is something inexplicable by the way that first start my bad it was not the first start where he got 0, 0.0 the first start was against the L.A. Chargers for Nathan Peterman, 2017. Six of 14 for 66 yards, no touchdowns, five picks. Somehow a 17.9 rating. The Not zero. He started the opening game the following year for Buffalo in Baltimore. Buffalo lost 47-3. to three. Nathan Peterman, five of 18 for 24 yards, no touchdowns, two picks. There's your blue Tarski, your 0, 0.0. I don't get it, man. Mm. I do not get it. Well, he's still in the league. We can praise Bo Nix for what he did during the week of the senior bowl. We wanted to see a little bit more. I blame the coaching, but Spencer Rattler, I, I don't know if I he broke started, Rachel's heart the I other thought, day. I thought he had a bad day on Tuesday and he got better. Wednesday he got better. Tuesday. Right. Uh, but I, I, I don't know if I broke Rachel's heart on the other day on coffee break. And I was like, Spencer Rattler's not good. Like, can we stop the Spencer Rattler talk, please? He's she, not good yeah. at football. Yeah. Did you actually say that? He's yeah. not good at football. Yeah, He's not good. Like you, Joe Milton is better. I mentioned Devin Leary as well. If we're talking about, and I think Rattler's a day three pick. And Leary's, Leary's got Leary's, some pop Leary in his arm it. too. Yeah, like, we saw it. He doesn't yeah. know where it's going, um, but we saw it. How many passes at the Shrine Bowl did we see where it was like, it was a really good pass, but the receiver wasn't anywhere near it because he just, I mean, it's like Milton. You know, I got the big arm. I can mm -hmm. sling it. I don't know where to put it yet. So Can't. I would, I personally would take a chance on those traits Rather than Over Rattler, Rattler, yeah, who's, you know, scrappy and all that. Uh, bottom line, first off, he's too small. Secondly, he doesn't have any sort of elite trait. And when I get to day three, you know me and the freaks. I want the Joe Milton arm, the Devin Leary arm. I want something that's like, okay, you can't coach that. With Rattler, he doesn't, he's not toolsy. He's not a guy that you can say he's got this one thing is elite. And the other stuff we need to work on, he needs plenty to work on. It's so. the one argument against, and I'd say that at any position, when you get to day three, against saying, okay, well, this guy, we know he's going to contribute on special teams. And I get that. I'd look, I'd look at the Broncos roster right now and say they've got enough special teamers. They've, they've upgraded that sufficiently. Mm -hmm. Day three, get me some traits. Freakish traits, mm -hmm. right? Um and maybe even roll the dice on some players who, you know, maybe there is a character concern or whatever, you know. But if they've got talent, 
that's you take those chances. It's okay. Um, and if even if they have even if they have no dings on their character, you take the chance on talent. Like you, you. That's why I love the Julius Thomas pick back in 2011. Yeah, basketball player. That's fine. I mean, shoot, crazy as it might seem, if you've watched March Madness, you've probably seen DJ Burns of North Carolina State, six nine. Forget his listed weight. He looks like he's playing at about three, about three bills. Okay. Okay. Incredibly light on his feet. Incredibly actual. You know, you see him in basketball. He's like a cheat code. He's just got back end, back end. And then he'll do this little sweet little fadeaway jumper type of thing. Or he'll make a little spin move around the shoulder. Virtually unstoppable. I'm not, that skill set probably isn't going to translate to the NBA. But as Jim Nagy of the Senior Bowl was saying, teams are, looking at him as mm -hmm. a tackle. Would I throw a roll of the dice on DJ Burns in the seventh round as a developmental tackle? Absolutely. One thousand percent. If he wants to play football, that's the key thing. Would he want to do it? If he's interested in that, he wants to do that, and he sees that as a potential path, absolutely I'd throw I'd roll the dice. I'd toss a dart on DJ Burns in the seventh round. I'm gonna throw one more freaky thing at you. We're gonna run a little long here today. It's fine. We're we're together again. So we're excited. Yeah we're riffing. We didn't We're talk like about Sean it. Sean was last week. Exactly. We didn't talk about it. Um, but when the Broncos were nosing around that rugby player that the flipping Chiefs got, did you know that guy was clocked at 24 miles an hour? A flipping rugby player at, I believe, 23 years old yeah. was clocked at 24 miles an hour. And the Broncos were interested, but the Chiefs ended up signing him. I'm like, NFL. You want the Chiefs to stop winning, stop letting them get freaks like that, and maybe the kid turns into something. Maybe you, he doesn't. You got to be patient. That's the but thing. you got to be patient. But you got to yeah. take a chance on those athletic traits. The dude runs faster than Tyreek Hill. Yeah, that's the thing. And, and you you'd make a pick like that, or you you sign Lewis Reese Zamet. That's the the Welsh rugby player. Okay, we're talking about. You'd sign him, and that first year, I don't think you'd expect any contribution. But you know what? He used the roster spot last year on Alex Forsyth, and he didn't get a jersey. J.L. Skinner barely got a jersey, right? So the Broncos have shown a willingness to take those last couple of roster spots and have a guy who basically is a non-factor just to develop, right? So I'm all, I'm all for chances like that. Mm-hmm. Now I don't go in relying on the player. I mean, I mean, no. someone was, I remember someone suggested on, on my Twitter that, Oh, could the Broncos look at Reese Zamet as a punt returner? I'm thinking, and having replaced Mar Marvin Mims, you can't say that, but you know what you can say? Yeah. Like not this year, especially with the new rules. And I can't remember who said it. And I apologize. If I remember, I'll hit you up on Twitter, but there's a conversation now. This is right up your alley mace with the rules change in the NFL for the returns. It's going to be spacing and kind of that rugby kind of how do you break out of a scrum? Yeah. Then in the return game is going to be more valuable than speed. And again, it was some sort of it was some coach, uh, you know, some NFL luminary that that was talking about this. I can't remember who it was, but it's a, it was fascinating. Honestly, I think uh, we should talk to the Broncos about this as well in terms of their special teams like scrum vision might be more of an asset than speed now with the rules changes on returns. When we get the chance, that's something that I think... Oh, well, you and Westhoff will spend three hours talking yeah, about that. Yeah, that's because, you know, <laughs> we get... We, there's an assistant coach day during the off-season, and that's where you can just kind of go and chat up the coaches. And, You'll talk to Westhoff. Yeah, I mean, and that's probably the first thing I'm going to ask him I'm is just, you know, tell me about the kickoffs... You know, your, le your level of involvement because you're one of the, you know, he's one of the people that uh, gets consulted on these sorts of things usually. Like, what is he thinking? Because it was very interesting to me to hear him last June talk about how even with kickoffs being what they were, that he expected it would be a plus thing for the Broncos. Mm -hmm. That's calling your shot. He lit up talking about Marvin Mims Jr. that day, even though Mims had not gotten on the practice field because he's been he'd been injured. Yes, this was June. This was June during mini camp, and I uh, gotta tell you, 
everything Westhoff said was right about that. Sounds about right. Yes, the Broncos were one of the best teams in the NFL on kickoff returns. Yes, it became a plus moment for them over the course of the year. So that's why I'm, I'm interested to see what kind of shot Westhoff calls in June. and Because he's probably day. going to be right about it. Yeah. Assistant coach day, y'all have plenty to talk to Westhoff about. You know who I'm going to talk to? Davis Webb. Yeah. You know I'm going to ask him about? Why is Nathan Peterman still in the league? <laughs> They're at the same senior bowl. That's true. And Antonio yeah. Pipkin. I totally forgot about him. I don't even think he had a cup of coffee in this league. No, nor did Sefo got in with um the uh, Bucks, Washington, I think, uh, or maybe. Oh, well, it was Tampa. It was yeah, Tampa. He, was, he was there for a camp or two. Yeah, like he that. didn't last. But yeah, that was man, that was a rough senior bowl for quarterbacks. It's not great, Bob. All right, uh, is that a wrap for today? We're getting a little. Uh, we went a little long. Everybody. I think so. We had a little long, yeah, today. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's okay. A little long, sorry. That's okay. But uh, we love you, and you guys love us on YouTube. Man Alive, 10,000 subscribers. It's so awesome we got there. Let's make it 20,000. And about roughly 51% of you that watch aren't subscribed. So please, you love the show, you want to support the show, you check out denversports.com, and then you help us out on YouTube. Mace, how do you do that? You can like, comment, comment share, share, subscribe. subscribe. Hit, Hit that, that notification, notification bell so that, that you, you never miss a vid. vid. Yeah, that's pretty how good. we do it. That's how yeah, we do thanks. It. Yeah, for all of you watching, over 500,000 views of this show, you know, watching the show or seeing the clips. We know you're out there. We appreciate you rolling with us. Thanks for checking in from England, by the way. We had a message come in from England. Exactly, right. Yes. All over worldwide. We're like prestige worldwide. <laughs> <laughs> God, I will not quote that song, although I'd love to. He's Andrew Mason. Follow him on all the socials at Mace Denver. I'm at Cecil Lammy. Thanks to Sean for running the show. Thanks for watching OBT. It's a BFD. Stay tuned and stay frosty.